So we're here today with Alyssa Lascala, also known as Biohacking Bombshell. She was um, driven by her own journey with conventional medicine to become an integrative health practitioner. Um, she's super passionate about finding the root cause of a range of different ailments, diseases, et cetera, that can stop us from living our best, fullest lives. Um, so we're super excited to have her here today to talk about her practice um, and what role EMFs play in that. So welcome, Melissa. And me, I'm excited to dive more into this topic that way too many people are not aware of the repercussions. So yeah, awesome. I guess let's start out by, I want to hear more about what your career as an integrative health practitioner is, what that means, et cetera. Yeah. Um, well, it, I knew I always wanted to get into health and wellness. That was always a passion for me, but um, it was really my journey when I ended up going through Lyme disease while I was in college that made me realize that conventional medicine was really failing me. You know, it could only get you so far, but I was not able to fully recover. I was not able to start thriving again until I ended up finding the world of integrative medicine, functional medicine. And so I've had my virtual practice for about six years now. I work completely virtually even before, you know, COVID came along and made telehealth like the cool thing to do. It was something that we were doing for a while so that I could work with clients all over the world. And yeah, my goal is to always help clients be able to start to identify many of the root causes. And one of them can be EMF exposure. Of course, it can exacerbate a lot of other health issues as well. So we talk about it all. We look at it very integratively. And then after we identify a lot of those causes, we look at some of the solutions, whether it be products like what you guys have, supplements, therapies, et cetera, to help them optimize their body, truly heal at the cellular level and start to live the fullest life that they can. Awesome. That's amazing. Um, I think it's really cool, the root cause approach. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that means? Yeah, I mean, many times it's the name it and blame it and tame it type of flow when it comes to conventional medicine and just seeing the surface level issue, whether it's high blood pressure, whether it's insomnia, whether it's ADHD, whether it's gut issues, whatever it may be. And then we go and we throw some type of um, Band-Aid on that. It could be some type of medication or birth control or whatever it may be. And it's never really getting to the root. So when you're looking at things like EMF exposure or um, parasites or radioactive elements in your water or in your food or mold toxicity or heavy metals, um, other types of pathogens out there. You have Lyme disease, you have co-infections that come along with the Lyme bacteria. All these things are really at the root in our conventional medicine system. Traditional medicine anymore is just, we just are wanting to sell a pharmaceutical, unfortunately. So the educational system in the medical world, I think is really broken. Um, but that's why I love what you guys do and the integrative health space, because we're determined to help people understand, listen, just because you're given a diagnosis, that's just a label for your constellation of symptoms doesn't mean you ultimately got to the root of why that's happening in the first place. And so that's root cause medicine. Keep asking why until you can't anymore. And that's when you're going to really get to the root of what's going on. So did that's this really stem, stem from when you had, when you were diagnosed with Lyme disease and you weren't necessarily getting all of the facts and getting down to the root cause, therefore you needed to feel like you need to be your own advocate and go out and educate yourself where did you start with that? That, I mean, that's a big, you know, rabbit hole to go down. I mean, I definitely had previous health issues beforehand. I remember taking my first stool test, not to get too TMI for people, but I had insane gut issues when I was a kid. It's super common for mm -hmm. kids and people go through their entire lives being like, I was fed kaopectate and Pepto-Bismol and things like that. Like, it was nobody's business. And I see this is a lot of people's reality. It's uncomfortable for people to talk about. So maybe people don't think it's that common, mm -hmm. but it's insanely common. And so I went my entire life up until my early twenties, just thinking this was just IBS. This is just what I had to deal with. And um, then it was manageable, but it was the Lyme disease where I was so fatigued, where I was burning the candle at both ends. I was in college staying up late studying, working hard, enjoying myself partying, like, you know, I was trying to live up my college years. And so I just thought that's really what the dynamic was until my roommate said, Alyssa, you should not be taking at least one, if not two naps a day for 
two to three hours at a time and skipping dinner and you need to go get blood work done. So I got it done. I had Lyme come back and it was the whole three weeks of doxycycline that they ask you to take with antibiotics. But it was a consistent issue for the next several years. And that's exactly right, Caitlin. I just got to the point where I was so failed by the system. I was constantly fatigued. My gut issues were starting to get worse. I was starting to be put on thyroid medication and, you know, adrenal support medications, hydrocortisone tablets and whatnot that I'm like, this is total band-aid mode. We're not getting there. So yeah, when you have to be your own best advocate, that's typically where you start truly learning because you don't have a choice. Yeah, I feel like the train kind of stops when everyone just um, accepts that a doctor is prescribing me something and that's just what needs to be done. But it's something that I've, I've had and I think is what's shifting and probably what you see with your clients is, um, you know, especially in your case, you're at a very young age. So you start taking thyroid medicine, you start taking all of the, all of these different prescriptions. What, so you're supposed to take those for the next 50 years? Like that, how, how can that be good for your body? Right? So what do you see? What do you typically see that, that, uh, from your clients and in their experiences that come to you and say, I need help. Is it, it very much in the same line of your experience of just saying, I need to get to the root cause, or I'm sick of taking all of these pills, or there's clearly more, there, there's more at play here from environmental and, um, you know, stressors and, uh, things involved that they want further assistance and, and guidance on. Yeah, most people have a very similar situation as me. And I think I attract that type of person, of course, because I'm very transparently sharing my experience. And I talk about that a lot on social media, especially on Instagram, all of my stories, my posts, my reels, my captions. They are talking about how broken our system is because people don't realize many times that it's broken until someone else is coming out and saying there is a different way. There is a better way. They don't know anything different. And so, yeah, many people have gotten to the point where they're laughed out of a doctor's office. They're told that they are um, essentially being like a hypochondriac. That's what I was told. Or their blood work will say that everything looks normal, quote unquote, and they know they don't feel normal. Mm -hmm. So they're like, there has to be a better way. So sometimes it's someone just starting out and starting to feel crappy and they, you know, by, you know, God's divine appointment, they find me sooner rather than later. Or some people, I mean, I just talked to a man that was 72 yesterday and he's been dealing with this stuff for over 50 years and mm -hmm. he's just tired of it. He's going into the VA clinic. They're saying everything looks fine. I can take one look at his blood work and it's not. And so, yeah, most people, they have just, I'm not their first stop. They have had enough. They've been dealing with this for way too long. And they're like, if I want to get my life back, I don't have a choice. We have to do something. How terrible and frustrating that must feel, especially at his age and you have to take the power in your own hands, right? Yeah. Yeah, I like how you put that, Caitlin, of being your own advocate in a system that doesn't work for you. And I'm guessing your practice is one of those steps for hopefully a lot of people. Um, hopefully one of the last steps that they have to take, right? It's getting to yeah. you. Yeah. Um, that's amazing. Um, so I guess kind of going off that and that root cause approach, I'm guessing there's, you know, a wide variety of, uh, solutions that you give your clients is that kind of where the biohacking comes in um, as those solutions for the root cause you know I created the name biohacking bombshell back in 2016 that was primarily what I started to do in my practice when I began to get into functional medicine and integrative medicine uh, the biohacking was a big portion of things I never knew that you could activate or upregulate certain genes in your body and express them in a different way to aid in your body's healing, right? So that's kind of where I started. And then over the last more so about like three to four years, it was more digging deep into drainage pathways and parasites and mold toxicity, all the things that as I started learning more about biohacking and integrative medicine, and I was peeling back all these layers, I uncovered Wow, I have mold in my home. Wow, I have mold in my body. Oh, I have breast implants. I need to remove them. They're adding to my toxicity. All of those things. So, um, so yeah, you can have supplements. You can have different therapies that technically biohack the body. Uh, but you can do uh, a variety of different things nutrition-wise as well. I mean, it's it's really endless. It's now kind of a buzzword yeah. that people hear when it comes to biohacking. It wasn't 
it wasn't really talked about as much when I first created it as the name of my business, the name of my clinic. But yeah, there are so many different ways to be able to do that. And I'm grateful for it because we have this big world of epigenetics and how you can change the way that your genes are expressed. And so I still believe in the foundational pillars like drinking clean water and eating whole foods. I'm not saying that biohacking is the sole solution, but with the amount of toxins and pathogens and stressors that we have in today's world, 5G everywhere, you can't go anywhere without Wi-Fi shooting through you. I mean, our bodies need this additional support. And I found it to be a really valuable tool in client healing. What yeah, do you typically, what, what's your process typically when you start with a client or even, you know, the man, man yesterday, do you go through all of their lifestyle, what their environment's like, what their typical days are like? What, what is that process like? I'm really curious because you're essentially learning so many different elements of their life is so important down to the smallest oh, yeah. things, like how many devices that you're around on a daily basis, you know? It's really thorough, um, which is why I can only do so many of these in a day because it is a really exhausting process <laughs> for the practitioner to just take in all this information and you have someone coming super emotional, right? Like they have already been through the ringer. They are wanting answers as soon as they reach your door. So it's also a great responsibility for the practitioner to ask the right questions and um, really look for the right answers and unpack this for somebody. So a big part of what I do before I even get on a call with somebody is we have two really specific forms. I have a very in-depth consultation form that dives into their lifestyle practices, whether it's nutrition wise, physical activity wise, when they go to sleep, when they wake up, what type of, how much water they're drinking, the type of water that they're drinking. Do we have air filters? What type of personal care products are you using? You know, family history. And then we go into all this toxicity assessment that is basically asking them to rate, you know, a bunch of different symptoms. And that can help me to start to categorize, okay, based off of these symptoms, it's not diagnostic, but based off of how you rated your symptoms, the frequency, the intensity, okay, it looks like we have a decent amount of signs of mold toxicity or potential Lyme disease or Bartonella or Babesia. Um, is there emotional trauma that we've had to work through? So we are unpacking a ton. I do a lot more on my initial call um, than I know some of my other practitioner friends will do. It just depends on your flow. Sometimes someone will do a little bit more of like an intro call and then we'll kind of move forward into the next really heavy hitter type of call, very comprehensive, but my initial consultations are 90 minutes long. I'm reviewing their history for at least a good 30 to 45 minutes before that, and then diving more into their stuff after I get off the call with them as well. So it's really thorough. It's really power packed, but I've done this a variety of different ways over the years in my clinic. And I just found that if I don't ask all this stuff up front, I'm not getting the full picture. And so will I have everything? Will I have all the data from labs that I would ideally like to have? No. But if I don't take a deep dive into case history and symptomatology, someone's going to leave feeling like, did you do anything different than the first doctor that I went to? So yeah, we, we dive deep that first call and it's very thorough and a lot of questions, but it's worth it. It's worth it. That's great. I mean, I know that, and I'm going to jump to this question, Millie, is you know, in our research, we've, we've seen a lot of people with Lyme disease and mold sensitivity can also be electromagnetic hypersensitive, hypersensitive. Like, is that typically, have you seen that in your practice based on not necessarily like a diagnosis based on the patterns that you see? And even just from my experience and what I know, Lyme disease is, can be very difficult to actually diagnose. It, it, sometimes it can be an actual fight to say, no, I have Lyme. Now diagnose me so I can actually, you know, treat this the right way. What do you typically see or have you seen the connection between Lyme and poss possible, possibly EHS? Honestly, most people that come to me, EMFs are one of the fewest things that they're thinking about. They may hear me talk about some of this stuff. It depends on how much of, honestly, my Instagram content they've they've dived into. I have a separate highlight bubble that goes over EMF. So some people will go through all of them, but many of them will hear me talk about parasites and mold and some of these other things or Lyme. And they hear about that, but they don't realize that the frequencies can, you know, increase the activity of Lyme bacteria or parasites or increase the duplication of mycotoxins in the body. Right. So some have come to me saying, listen, I've noticed a difference since this 5G tower went up, since the smart meter went on my home they may think about it. Most never put two and two together. So I will see that. Um, 
I don't think there's a way, at least that I've done right now, where I'd really be able to assess and say, oh, I think it's solely the EMFs mm -hmm. that are exacerbating this. It's typically more of helping them to understand wiring your devices, using your life tune devices, turning off your Wi-Fi router at night, et cetera. And then when they start to see that they've really reduced their exposure and they see the improvement in their symptoms for many people, um, that's when they start to m connect the dots. And that's when I can better connect the dots because it is really challenging unless I'm going and measuring, um, you know, some type of pathogenic activity in the body for me to say, yes, this was solely from that. But I see it time and time again, people will start to sleep better when their routers are out of the room or when they're using airplane mode or when they're using devices like that, even if it's just also giving them peace of mind mm -hmm. to just know they have something that's restructuring the frequencies. So it's typically more of a let's change these things and I want you to start to see some of the patterns. But I also allow people to know just because you start turning off your Wi-Fi router, just because you start using your life tune device, just because everything is in all of a sudden rainbows and cupcakes in your health, it doesn't mean that this is not doing its job. And I think that's just as important to help people understand because we're looking for this end all be all and we'll go and invest in a device or take the time to go and rewire our house so that the router is not in our bedroom closet and it's away further than us um, throughout the day. And if someone doesn't see a significant noticeable shift, they may think this isn't working. And I make sure that they know that that's not true. It still is adding to your toxic load. So we need to reduce it regardless of whether you feel a significant shift or not. That's the challenge that we yeah. typically see. And that's, that's the challenge of EMF in general. It's invisible. You know, if you can't see it, it's hard to say it, it's making an impact. But um, what we try and, and educate and get people to consider is the compounding effect, the amount of devices that you're on. Look, we, we live in a digital world. We love technology. We love it. The evolution that it has provided for this world, and it's only going to continue. And it's, it's amazing. We all love it. We live it, breathe it. But how do we live more harmoniously with it? So do you get anybody, you know, do you have to go around kind of that education of from the, this is invisible, but it's still, it still matters. <laughs> yeah. I touch on it with every client. Part of that initial consultation form that I mentioned to you that I give to every initial client before our first call is, do you use Wi-Fi in your house? Where is your router located? Where are your Wi-Fi extenders? And I typically will notice, I have to add this to my form, but many people will come with AirPods in their ears or things like that. that they're we're trying to listen to the call. So it doesn't matter who it is, we always touch on it. And on every single client protocol I have here, here's the life tune device. Here are other things that you can do to mitigate your exposure. So everyone learns whether or not that's the most important thing for them right then. Like maybe for them, we're still drinking tap water. They're doing all these other things. So it still may be a certain order that somebody goes in as far as what they think is the most important for them, but everyone gets educated on it because otherwise, yeah, people will think, it's just people that are wearing, you know, tinfoil hats and you're, you're just crazy or a spouse will be like, heck no, I'm not going through the process of rewiring our router to a different area. And it may take some time, but we continue to emphasize it until it sinks in. That's great. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I guess prior to starting that process and introducing it to your clients, how did you discover, um, you know, the problem with EMF in your own journey? It's a good question because I, it's not like there's a significant event where I'm like, oh yeah, this is, this is what's going on. Um, I ended up learning about you guys specifically through another, um, I guess she would be an ND that I was following. I was on her email list and she sent stuff out about you guys. And it was the, the scans that you guys have of the activity in someone's brain when they're holding their phone right up next to their head versus when they have your device on it. And I was like, I can get on board with that. Like I knew it influenced that. And I've learned over the years from different practitioners and whatnot that I follow how these frequencies were affecting things in the body. And the more I learned that, oh, I have mold, I have parasites, that I took it even more seriously. I did wireless technology forever. I use Bluetooth on everything. And you know, in the gym, I you know, I, I used to work out even way more than I do now and everyone's wearing wireless technology. So it was, it took a good amount to still convince me when I see the studies that you guys have or the graphics that you guys have, I think that's super important for most people to see, because like you said, it's invisible and it's really inconvenient to 
be at the gym or be going through the airport or wherever and have a cord dangling versus, you know, using wireless headphones or, you know, having a simple sticker on there. But it was seeing those graphics that I know was one of the biggest triggers for me to take it more seriously because it was a visual. Otherwise, everything's invisible and no one thinks about it. Yeah, totally. They need everybody needs some kind of visual reinforcement, like you said. Um, and then I think you've touched on it a couple of times now about how EMFs kind of make the toxic load worse or causes them to react differently within your body. Can you explain that a little bit more? So there are plenty of studies out there that will show that these frequencies, how they interact with a lot of different pathogens out there, um, they can really vibe off of that. And you have things like a Rife machine that some people may use for Lyme disease, if they've heard about that. And so certain frequencies can help to eradicate certain things from the body. Okay, well, if it's causing them to be eradicated, if it can cause die-off reactions, if it can be part of that healing process, you don't think the frequencies that we're being exposed to with all these other devices that aren't being regulated and monitored like a rice machine, you really don't think it's affecting those pathogens too? It just, it doesn't make sense until people start to really unpack it. But yeah, there are studies showing how the um, you know mycotoxins will duplicate much more quickly being around these frequencies. Those studies are out there. And then overall, the impairment of the mitochondria in the body. So if you are, for people that don't remember from high school biology, with the mitochondria being the powerhouse of the cell, they're making all of your energy. If your mitochondria don't work well, you don't work well. You're not going to have as much energy. Your brain's not going to function the same. Your muscles won't. You won't detox the same. So that is a really big thing. Even if you're trying to detox from all these other pathogens, if you don't have the mitochondrial functioning, you're going to have a really hard time. So those are the three biggest things that I remind my clients are greatly influenced by these frequencies. And even just your body's ability to recover in sleep when you're being bombarded with all of these things, that's huge as well. So it's all integrated. But if you don't end up helping someone to see either the graphics that you guys have or point them to the exact study where it's showing how these frequencies affect them, it's hard for them to really conceptualize that. Oh, definitely. And, you know, the fact that it is down on the cellular level that it's having an effect, not something big on your body or in your brain. It's really down to, you know, the neurotransmitters, the cells, everything. Um, I think that's super interesting about, yeah, everybody remembers powerhouse of the cell, but nobody thinks about how that's, yeah, your whole energy source in your body. Um, yeah. So that's super interesting. Um I feel like that was most of my questions. Caitlin, do you have any other questions? I mean, ever since, you know, we've, we've spoken with you and, you know, learning what you do and how you're helping people um, in, in their lives, I've, I've always had more questions about mold sensitivity and just people's relations to mold. Um, mold is scary. Just think about you know, being around it and what you don't, what you see, there's also what you don't see. I'm, I'm curious within your practice, what your approach and in, in how you interact when it comes to mold, because I feel like it is a lot more common um, than, than people realize. And, um, you know, how that plays into sensitivity as another factor in, in into your health. Um if, if you want to elaborate on, on the mold front, that would be excellent. I absolutely think it's way more common than people realize. And there's, I mean, there's plenty of different, depending on what resource you read, maybe the percentage will be different, but, you know, about 50 to 60% of homes, at least in the United States, have some type of mold within them. And I think that's honestly on the lower end. I think that it's way higher than that. And so many people think, oh, well, I'm in a new build. Oh, my home was just built or it was built two years ago or it's only five years old and we've never had any water damage. It doesn't mean that you don't have mold in your home. And so part of my uh, toxicity assessment and my in-depth consultation form will ask somebody, how old is your home? When did you move in? Did you start having any new symptoms since moving into that home? Have you ever had water damage at home or work or school? If so, what happened there? Did you get it remediated? And, um, you know, I'm not the end all be all person for mold. If I start identifying that I think that someone needs to test their house for mold, which is honestly majority of my clients, I will outsource them um, to 
shameless plug. A good, she's become a good friend of mine. PJ Harlow. I don't know if you know her from Instagram. PJ Harlow Wellness is her handle. She is a plethora of knowledge. Mold Finders is a really other good resource as well. There are select few people that I would refer to to know how to do the testing properly because I think there may even be some people that may say, oh, I'm listening to Alyssa or I'm following these other practitioners and yeah, I have the brain fog or we have a lot of sinus issues in my family or, you know, I'm having just like a lot of fatigue. I'm having respiratory issues. I mean, there's so many different symptoms that come along with mold and maybe they'll go and get these little like Petri dish tests from Amazon or they'll go on their older, their own ERMI test, but they don't know how to interpret it properly. And they're getting this false sense of security that their home is fine. They're getting this false sense of security when they have what they think is a negative test or a decent test. And when you have a professional like PJ Harlow to be able to unpack that, she can very clearly show you she even has some of this stuff for free on her Instagram. This may look okay, but it's not okay. And so I think it's important to share a lot of that because people think that just because you don't have black mold growing on the walls in your home or it doesn't smell like mildew, that there's not an issue. For me, I had so many symptoms. I had been working with my functional MD for probably about three and a half years before I got to the point where I was still, he put me on new medications when I was in there. And as grateful as I was for him to try and help me survive at that point, I got to the point where I'm like, what else is left? We got to be missing something. And he said, oh, I just went to a seminar and I learned about mold. (laughs) And I think it goes along with Lyme. Really commonly, you see a lot of them together. So we tested and I was off the charts for mold within my system. So I'm like, okay, where's this coming from? So we started to dig through our basement and my husband found it up in the rafters. And so that's how we found ours. Never really, we knew that there was water damage in the home before, but we never saw anything. We never smelled anything. We had to go digging. Many people have no idea. It can be in the drywall, you know, behind behind the walls. You don't know until you have someone that knows how to test, that knows what they're doing. So I'm really glad that you're asking about this because I do think that this and EMF sensitivity can really be linked together and people don't realize the connection there. But this is a root for so many people's health issues and they just think that if you don't see mushrooms on the wall, (laughs) that it's not a problem. And it is. And it, it takes time to detox from. It's hard. So the relationship between mold and the EMF sensitivity is that more around if you are if you are sensitive to EMF, those frequencies are affecting your mitochondria, and then you layer on mold exposure to that. It's further it's further um, stopping your body from healing and or operating the way that it should. Is that a pretty accurate description? So you can have the EMFs that are impairing the mitochondria, which will make it harder for you to deal with any toxin or pathogen, mm-hmm. whether it be mold or otherwise. Um, You also have the EMF increasing the duplication, the activity of the mold throughout the body. So that's another sector. But then you also have, it's sometimes it's kind of like what came first, the chicken or the egg. You have the mold toxicity that you have that's impairing TH1 and TH2 in the immune system. It's really impairing the mitochondria. And then you have EMF exposure and it's like, okay, that's even harder to deal with. So I think it could kind of go either way when it comes to which is being the most impairing. They're both really threatening either way it's a bad combo that does not set your body up for success <laughs> yeah exactly okay thank you that's that's really helpful yeah definitely i think uh, what you mentioned about them being kind of adjacent topics emf and mold probably other ones too but with the brain fog you know fatigue things like that that are hard um kind of universal symptoms for a lot of different reasons So I think that's really cool that you take that integrative approach to, yeah, let's address a lot of these things at the same time so that, you know, we're checking all the boxes. I think that's super interesting. Sure, for sure. And And it can be really overwhelming for someone. I think that's probably one of the hardest tasks as a practitioner is you're getting all this information and someone's sharing all this information with you. So they know that it clearly pays a role. But our job is to be able to walk someone through so that it's not that you have to do everything all at one time because you already have someone that's super sick and typically impaired in some way, shape or form. So to think that they have to do everything to get better right away isn't the case. But yeah, it absolutely is important to look at everything or you can miss a huge pillar. And I think that EMFs are a big pillar that many practitioners do miss. They think about a lot of the other things they are talked about more but with the way that our technology is growing anymore and how frequent 5G towers are and all the things, 
it can't be ignored. It needs to be part of a regular conversation. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking about, a. we were talking with, um, Dr. Robert Turner. He's a, a child neurologist and, um, he talked about the patterns that he's seen, uh, even just children with epilepsy and seizures at such young ages. And, um, even just in a hospital setting and, and what their, what their environment is like, EMF, I, we, we agree. EMF is a pillar and it's one of those things that even just with our solution, it, it's a controllable. You can take something and live harmoniously or, and live alongside your devices um, in a healthier way. Just generally, because you cover so many different you know, realms, what other pillars do you feel like in the next five, 10 years that you feel are really should and will be the major shift to people really taking control and being proactive in their lives for healthy, for a healthy lifestyle? That's a really good question. I think, I think heavy metals have been something that more people have started to become aware of that. That's probably a more of a recent emphasis that a lot of people are, especially with like the heavy metals and vaccines and different things like that. Heavy metal detoxes, whether it's medical medium or other big platforms that have started to share that. I think that's one that people need to address, but has already been covered a little bit more than say something like parasites or mold. I think there's being there's more education that's coming along when it comes to these things. But I think parasites are something that more people need to learn about and not enough people think that you know, so people will comment all the time and say, well, I don't eat poop, you know, I, so I don't have a parasite. I literally get that comment on my social media and I'm like, I, I can't even, I just can't, it's not even worth the battle sometimes, but these are especially since COVID has come out and, you know, we've had the way, whether you consider it a virus or an exosome or anything, how it's interacting with the stuff that was already existing in people's bodies before this even became an issue that's I see there's a lot of parasitic properties and activity that seems to be happening when people are either getting COVID or getting the gene therapies. And so I think that's something that we need to address more exactly why people are taking ivermectin and whatnot to try and help. And so I think there's something there. There definitely is something there. So I think parasites are going to be something that more people are starting to learn more about and being willing to address. Uh, I think mold is going to start to get a little bit more of the attention that it deserves, but parasites, I think, are more of that taboo topic that especially with all the ivermectin stuff that's happened in the last, you know, two and a half years, people are seeing it a little bit more. A lot of it's suppressed, so it may take some time, but I think that's the direction that a lot of people will start to head. That's a good, uh, that's a really good topic because I, I feel the majority or just in my sense, you're, you're not going around and putting your mouth or licking random things to get parasites or you're not traveling to uh, a, a one-off country where you eat something and you get you know a bad bad experience and you feel like oh i got a parasite of some kind you know i'm eating food right. i'm in a completely different i don't know what the water source is those are usually like the main two things that you think about from a parasitic standpoint because everyone else is putting you know the hand sanitizer on their hand they're washing their hands and other than that you should be fine everything's clean right exactly people don't realize that i mean you have pets you have pets like they are not cleaning themselves daily you're not cleaning them daily they're probably stepping in poop bringing it into your house or people have cats with the kitty litter or i mean they found parasites in water in the United States, someone can sneeze and have a pinworm egg be suspended in the air, or you're touching a surface and there's a pinworm egg on there. So they just don't, people just don't know. Yeah. And once they know, then it makes more sense. But exactly. You don't have to be traveling to some type of underdeveloped country mm -hmm. to acquire one. Wow. Yeah, that's super interesting. I'm going to dive in for sure on some of those topics now that you've brought them up. I mean, I think also the mitochondria um, point is super interesting too. We've talked about cellular health a little bit, but not specific to the mitochondria. So I'm super excited to learn more about that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, is there anything else, I guess, that you want to leave off um, the conversation with? Anything else that you want people to know? I feel like this was super, super educational. I hope it's educational for a lot of a lot of our um, community as well. So is there anything else you wanted to talk through? I think just to kind of bring it home is if you don't think that this is a thing, 
don't stay so ignorant to not do the research because it is out there. You guys have incredible resources through your blog. Um, childrenshealthdefense.org has a lot of different things in all different spectrums when it comes to root cause issues. And it's not, of course, just applicable to children. It's applicable to adults as well. Uh, but if someone is telling you that this is woo-woo or that this isn't valid, the studies are out there and it's just true ignorance if someone is choosing not to look at it. So please look at it. Please share with people that you know and take this stuff seriously because it's cumulative. It's over time. It's not going to be something that's instant for a lot of people where many of these symptoms and whatnot happen. But, you know, if, if we're impairing our mitochondria, we reproduce children that have more impaired mitochondria. And so it's a trickle down effect through the generations. And then you have the children that they're, they're um, you know, skull bones are not as well formed. They're way more pliable and they're really influenced. And you have all these kids that are on these wireless devices and they're having the wireless headphones. And I'm like, oh my God, like we're frying our future generation's brains. So please pay as much attention to this for yourself as you do for your kids or even more to your kids because they're even more susceptible. So I probably just close with that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, well thank you so sorry. much for your time. Sorry, I just have Go one follow-up question. Do you work with any parents for their kids specifically? Many times the parents will come to me and work on them first and they want to carry all these concepts and they just immediately start implementing with their kids. Okay. Do I work with children? For sure, for sure. But most times the parents are like, oh my gosh, I'm so sick. Let me do this for myself. I'm going to immediately carry over a lot of these practices for my kiddos. But yes, I will meet with both if needed. A lot of them feel, though, that when they have the degree of education that they have, that they can take what we learn together and do it with any member of their family. That makes a lot of sense. That's great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I think there was a lot of education here. I think it's really interesting to learn about your practice, too. Um, obviously, it's always fun to talk about EMFs for us, but all the other topics that you covered um, are, you know, they're adjacent topics and super important for overall wellness, which is what we want to promote. We're just one part of that um, picture. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, guys. Thank you, Alyssa. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.